All right, Jason. We're coming on a spot. We need to split up. I say. Okay. We, let's use our radios, but we need to use nicknames. Cool, like cool guy nicknames. No, that's no, that's dumb. I'll see you on the other side. Uh, Chocolate Charlie calling Wiener Whistle. I am in position on the other side of the barn. You? I I told you no code names. Uh, got it, Wiener Whistle. Uh, moving to you. If I'm gonna have a code name, can I have something besides Wiener Whistle, like, like Rocky Flash? Oh, now you want a cool nickname. Hey Wizards, what's going on? We're out here doing some night vision training again and I'm really excited about this. And once again, I have Jason with me for this training event. Yeah, so the focus here, this is gonna be a three-part video series of us learning more about the tools and the skills that go along with night vision and less about the firearms and the shooting side of the house. And our thought process is, you know, as a mission goes on, you have to be able to use all these different pieces and all these different things. We're just being able to use the firearms that 1%. So we really want to learn the other 99% of what we need to know how to do and how to use it all when using night vision. We're also out here again with the Jawless Hog guys. And in the YouTube world, there's a lot of emphasis that's placed on your pedigree. And these guys have spent the time and really know what they're talking about. So let me introduce them to you. Let them tell you about who they are, remind you about what we did with them last year. And then we'll get into all this silly training we're going to do. It's, it's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah. So one more thing too, to be clear. The scenarios that we're going to be going through are not realistic. We understand that, but we're kind of building this to force ourselves to use the tools and learn the skills that we're going to be talking about this weekend. So calm down, Ronnie. Seriously. All right, we're back out here with the PLD guys, kind of doing a follow-up from our last night vision opportunity with them. A little bit different this time around. We're going to talk about and go over some of the ways to use a night vision without necessarily running the weapon side of it. We're going to go into the technical side of it, the setup side of it, how to properly run it. Uh, we're going to focus on helmets, how to set up the helmets, the lights, where to place them, how to set them, and how to run them, uh, based on my experience and how we do that. How you guys doing today? I'm Chris McGowan. I'm with Jawless Hog Tactical. I've been in law enforcement for 20 years, and I've been on a tactical team for the last 14 years. Over the last 14 years, we've gotten into night vision, and my perspective with night vision definitely comes from a law enforcement perspective. I have no military background, so I can't speak on that. And some of the law enforcement stuff is, could be applicable to, to the civilian side of things. Hey, my name's Nick Shepard. I'm with Joel Slope Tactical. I uh, started my career into this industry in this world you know, several years ago with the uh, city of the United States Army. Uh, a few tours overseas, uh, doing different combat or operations, training for military, et cetera. And there I transferred into law enforcement. I've been law enforcement just shy of 15 years. I uh, worked my way through every position in the SWAT team. I'm currently acting as a SWAT commander for my agency. Uh, go pretty significant background, a, a wide spectrum of things. We've worked, been working with night vision, either on the civilian side through the hunting with night vision and thermal devices, as well as in the law enforcement aspect for tactical operations. And obviously my experience the military, both the United States military is working with foreign militaries as well. So I like to put a wide scale of that together to kind of come up with the best of my operational experience for all spectrums of everything to kind of apply that to the training that we're conducting. So stick with us. I think you'll learn a lot. So the biggest thing I want to reiterate with what Shepard is talking about too is, you know, mission really dictates gear and is going to dictate how you're going to set things up and how you're going to run it. We at TLD often look at things as a more civilian perspective. Um, Chris does things in a more police perspective. And then Shepard brings a military perspective. So we're going to show you some different ways to set things up. They're, they're going to teach us how to do it from all those different angles. But I just want you to be aware that this isn't the only answer. It's not the only solution, but there's some different ways to do it from what they've learned and what they've done already in the field that how they found that works for that. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of always and never. Nothing works always. Nothing works never. And I'm um, a firm believer, especially on the LA side, the military side, is you know the mission drives your capabilities, the mission drives your setup, and we're going to kind of include that into the night. You know, just show different things for what we're doing. Now, before we get started, there's a whole bunch of companies we've got to say thanks to that helped to make this happen today. With HRT, obviously the Jawless Hog guys, I want to say a big thanks to Opscore for helping us with our helmet setups. Big thanks to Princeton Tech for all of our lights. Big, huge thanks to Nocturne for all of our night vision. They let us use not only the Manicore R, but also the Daisho and Tanto configurations. So we're going to be showing you guys off a cool, ton of cool stuff. Uh, also, big thanks to Brown Bear. We're going to be doing a lot of the first-person recordings you're going to see as to how we're actually working through all these problems. That That's how we're actually going to share it all with you. So big thanks to them. That's it, though. All right, we'll get into it. 
can start talking about the task lights on the helmets. And TLD guys are going to have a lot of different equipment. They're going to have to figure out how to use and when to use and why to use that. For example, you know, task lights, they, they come in a wide variety. Princeton Tech's a very popular one. Surefire makes a van, vampire task light. You see a lot of different setups on helmets. So we're going to talk about and we're going to go through when to use IR, when to use white light, you know, when to maybe use a blue or a red. So, for example, if we're still trying to, if we're losing our certain ambient light and our night vision is starting to get fuzzy because we're not getting any kind of lighter natural light coming into the intensifiers, we may need to take that task light and shoot a little canopy with the IR. Or if we need to set, see something, if we're working medical, for example, we might need to go with a white light. Or maybe we need to hunker over, read something small from the bottom of our nods looking under them. Maybe we activate that red light. It just kind of depends on what you're doing and why you're doing it. But we're going to make sure these guys know how to function that equipment and when to use, what to use, and why. Yeah, so you kind of already covered this, but one of the questions that I had was specifically about strobes. I, I have zero experience in this world. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to Walsh on the drive up here, like, walk, playing Call of Duty way back when, and there was a mission where you're an AC-130 gunner and you have to not hit the guys with the strobes. But what about you have no overhead coverage? It's just a ground crew. Like, are do strobes matter? Do you would you actually use them? Well, first, Call of Duty is always right. Yeah. So if you saw it on Call of Duty, Call of Duty it one hundred percent applies in the real world. I just I want to put that out there so that everybody okay. knows. Perfect. If you if you are a Call of Duty warfighter, you're a real warfighter. All right. Thank you. Uh, secondly, from an operational standpoint, even in law enforcement, especially with the technology age, you know we're running a lot of drones. Okay. So open area searches, woodland searches, or even perimeters on like a barricaded subject. You know, if it gets night or running night vision operations, we've done it before, making an approach, setting up a perimeter, essentially. We'll have our drone pilot overhead, and we'll have our IR strobes on outside because he can still pick that up on the drone yeah. and then give back to the command center or myself as the commander or the acting team leader positions the office snipers the same way. If they're on an overwatch and a hide, they can activate that IR strobe, and now we know the location where if they move, we can still pick them up and track them. Okay. So... They are useful. Um, a lot of civilians kind of more so, I think, buying for the cool factor. Okay. And then they want to turn them on all the time, like inside. And they end up being too bright, and they kind of will start to wash out your night vision and push too hard. So I think they have a place, and I think they are a very useful tool. But again, it depends on what are you doing and why are you doing what you're doing. The other question I had is, do you set up your helmet where you have like a white light set up on one side of the helmet and an IR set up on the other side to kind of differentiate it? Or do you, are there, are there, products out there that kind of incorporate everything in one like how do you what's a proper way i guess to set up a, a, a helmet so there's not really a definitive answer on that um like your gun belt your your rig your rifle everything is based on the on the user on the operator and what you're doing and what you're doing okay um, myself personally i run a princeton tack light that has a red white and ir and that's pretty much all i run on my helmet i do have a strobe i have a hello store strobe and that's what i set up on my helmet now i set it on my left side and the reason I put it on my left side, again, due to preference, so that if I need to go and activate that, I can still maintain a hand on my firearm, whether it be pistol, long belt, whatever the case may be. I don't really see a whole lot of need for a white light on a helmet, um, except for the possible you know, range, safety, checking targets, different things like that. Because if you're going to go white light, you're, you're kind of going to go white light, just use a smaller hand light or something like that. If you're in a non-permissive environment and you're trying to be stealthy, you're obviously probably not going to activate a white light you know, you maybe cover up, use a red light to read something, something along those lines. But I mean, a lot of the manufacturers are making them where they have that multi set up and the multicolor lights. So there's nothing wrong with it. Just make sure you know how to use it. Wherever you set it up for that, make sure you're training within your profession with it so that you know what you're doing and where it's at. TLD guys, your mission, if you accept, on a clearly voluntary basis because of level and danger of this mission is a transition from outside of a structure to inside of a structure. Using only your task lights and the other tools on your tool belt. The goal of this mission is going to be to enter, enter and clear the structure looking for any kind of intelligence to find while we no footprint. Hey guys, so we're about ready to start this. We just want to talk about what our helmet setups are really quick. So on the right side here, I have the Princeton Tech MPLS. On the left hand side, I have the Princeton Tech Charge X running an Opscore bump helmet, and I have the Noctor Nocturne Tanto with the Daisho Bridge set up. And I'm gonna be running the Opscore SF helmet. I have the Surefire Vampire 340 that I'm running for the lights, and I'm running a Streamlight stock along with the Nocturne Manacore R. So that way when we go to test everything and learn how to do it all. You guys can see the performance of the different items and we kind of learn about it too. All right though, you ready? Ready. All right, let's go dark. Let's go.
All right, so let's turn on, first thing, let's turn on strobes, and let's okay. see how difficult that is to turn on. Yeah. My SNS Manta, it seems like a one click. Am I on? Yeah, I'm definitely told that I'm on. Yep, am I on? Yep, looks like you're, you're single. Press it one more time first, try one more. That's brighter, go again. Oh, now you're strobing, yeah. All right, so we're gonna see how the strobe effect is. We'll see uh, how obnoxious this is gonna get. Oh, uh, dude, already off the glass of this door. It's already kind of annoying. So I'm already here, and I'm gonna see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight this, Jason, with the IR task light. So we gotta come in here without turning the lights on. Okay. Okay, I can see that a little bit better. Yep, I got the door handle. Okay. I can tell you right now, your uh, your strobe is extremely annoying inside. Yeah. Let's let's kill strobes. Now, I kind of want to see how these task lights work differently. So let's try the Surefire Vampire. Oh, oh okay. Which one do you got there? So that's the Charge Prince X. Tech, Prince Tech Charge X. I kind of like that one. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's overbearing. Can you point that upward at all? Sort oh, of. It'll stay there too. Yeah, it has a little like telescoping. Arm. I will say from my standpoint, when you look at me, like here, look at me a little bit, it's not, it's not autogating my nods really bad, but it, it is a little bit bright. Like, do yeah. you have that aimed upward a little bit right now? Yeah, it's aimed upward. Okay. Oh, okay. I see the difference. Oh, yeah. The aimed upward, uh, the aimed upward is a lot better. Yeah, yours is aimed right at me. Oh, your, is this one? Your right one. Yeah? And it's like halo effect. Is that better? Yeah. Yep. Okay. What about, let's try the crazy one. You ready for this? Yeah. All right, hold on. This is the Surefire. That seems that seems a bit insane. Does yeah. this blind you? Oh yeah, I can't see you at all. I just see light. <laughs> okay, what if we what if we canopy spilled? Oh, perfect. Oh, the canopy spilling on is fantastic. Okay. All right, so it seems like the the surefire is a little bit of overkill, particularly in this hallway area. I kind of want to see if it works at all to just switch over to just our task lights. Yeah, for IR. So let's see if we can just do that. Okay. And so that's what I have on right now. I'll tell you right now that that's hard. That charge, uh, charge X. Okay, I had, to, oh, I had to open my lenses back up. So I, I lose a little bit of that uh, change in view, where it's harder to see further objects now because I can't use the irises. But I still feel like I have plenty of light. Okay. You ready to go? Oh, I think there's a note here. I can't read that. Is this what we're looking for? Let's see if we can... Maybe on the red light? You have red light on your MPLS. Can you read that? Uh, I think it says the... Oh, I'm having trouble reading this. I think it says there's uh, the target's in a different building than this one. What are, you, what are you talking about? It clearly says Welsh is dumb. I, uh, I don't know. Okay, yep. All right, he's in a different building. And in that. All right, so they were able to accomplish their mission, complete their task. A couple things I noticed just kind of watching them run that they could have done is they could have used their task light in sync with each other. They could have had one canopying, kind of given they, that little bit of a bloom, they could have had one kind of running forward. They could have also incorporated some use of their IR laser devices, their illuminator, their laser different things like that to push down to a room or get that flood down the hallway to kind of open up that, give them more visibility and take the graininess out of the night vision. There's a small, some tidbits through in there that they could have done to maybe help make them move a little bit better or see a little bit, a bit better, make the night vision work better in that no light situation. Now, I agree with everything you just said. And then there at the end on this super unrealistic scenario, the they could have just transitioned to a red or blue light to read what the note said instead of trying to sit there and fiddle around with the gear and trying to get the ir to work with the night vision the they're not going to keep that red or blue light on very long just to read the note and then see what they got to see turn it off and again move on absolutely did you did you lower the camera i didn't touch it 
Oh, it seems like a door. So I want to give you guys some of our thoughts also running through that and using some different things. Um, I will say I really like the input that um, Shep and Blue gave us. I guess we didn't really think about using the task lights in unison, like doing two different things yeah. with each of the lights. I will say the strobes, um, as soon as we went indoors, that was probably the most obnoxious thing. And as soon as we went in, we didn't even have to be told to turn those off. We wanted those off as quick as we could uh, from a CQB side. Once, you, once you're inside, um, I don't really see the effect yeah. of the strobes. And I don't know if it was because mine was brighter than yours, but it was bad, but it, it was bearable for me. Mm, okay. Right. Maybe it, was, it was just the fact that everything was flooding everywhere. Yeah. One more thing I found I really liked was the Surefire Vampire. What, what did you think about that one in terms of the flood? So super bright. I mean, I felt like it... it Bloom the area that we were in really well. But I do like what Shep and Blue were talking about. And I wish we would have thought about it because there were some times where I felt like the depth was missing and having a, a task light or something pointing down range down that hallway or using, or our, using our IR lights on our weapons. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that would have been really beneficial for that depth perception piece. But I don't know. We'll, we could try it on. Well, and it kind of just says the whole thing. You use all the tools. You know, we were kind of using this super realistic scenario to focus on using the task lights and the strobes and everything else. But in, in reality, we need to push into a room. We use those task lights. Yeah. And the irises, so we had two different setups. So I had irises set up on my Manicore R, which made the flood even crazier where I could just spin the irises and get a get a different depth of field and then turn on the floodlight. And then suddenly you could see everything. So it was really a game changer in that setup as to how quickly I could move indoor and outdoor. But I felt like I was just blinding you in the same setup. Yeah, yeah I don't have irises, so I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. So maybe the viewers will show them what we mean, but it, it's hard to explain. But overall, I think this was pretty awesome. I learned a whole lot about how each thing gets used. And you really need to get out in the field and actually use them and have that like well, aha moment. Yeah. So a couple of things when when you were saying like, hey, come over to my shoulder, like it's a doorway. Like I can't I can't fit with you there. So uh, maybe instead of that, it could have been, you know, half of my body behind half of your body going down the hallway that way. So. There's, you're going to come into areas where you might not be able to double up. And so how do you adapt and overcome those problems? Yeah. So really cool. Super fun. Uh, first piece. I know we had a few different questions for Shep and Blue. So I'll leave it to Jason to ask him some things that maybe clarify or a little bit more learning what would happen in, in a more realistic capacity. Yeah. So like this scenario that we're going through, if this were a, a law enforcement scenario, you're going in for a hostage rescue, you're going in to gather intel. At what point would you just turn on white light and start searching instead of searching under nods. Yeah, so obviously that's going to depend on the layout and the mission. You know, hostage rescue is a little bit different beef. You know, obviously the priority of life shifts. Mm -hmm. You know, stealth is essentially authorized, you know, in order to save a to save a hostage. Now, if you're talking something like a, a low or a high-level search warrant or, or an intel gathering or something like that, you know, you're probably going to go white light relatively quick and announce your presence. Uh, you know, based on case law and a few other things, you know, you guys have announced yourself as a law enforcement officer. You know, so you're not really sneaky, sneaky, sneaky throughout the night, running through houses with night vision on. You know, and one of those things goes, if a shooting does come out, you know, a justification was, you know, I didn't know it was the police. Right. I thought it was somebody breaking into my house. Okay. So you want to get that announcement, that announcement out and get white light. Uh, you now announce police, white light areas, turn lights on, et cetera, to essentially light that up because we're, we're bringing in multiple people, multiple guns, multiple different tools in our trade that might be more utilized better without night vision compared to using night vision. Hey guys, so for the next part of our evolution in the night vision world, we're going to do a PID drill. I got one set up here for the boys and essentially what we're going to do, we're going to face down range on command fire. You will turn, I will give you a color, a number and uh, or letter and then you have to identify what that target is. If you can't see it under your night vision, you can't make out the color, you need, probably need to transition to white light. If you can see it with your IR, shoot it with your IR. It's gonna to be totally up to the shooter what they can or cannot see and what they perceive they think they see. The whole idea is to be able to, to identify what you're shooting at before you ever pull the trigger. So let's set this up and see how the guys do. All right, so we're getting started with this drill. I have a couple questions. So do we just engage one of the targets and, and as soon as we can, or do we do kind of a sweet motion? How do we do this? Right, so here I'll just demo it real quick and I'll explain as I walk through it. So you guys will both be facing down range in a carry position with the muzzle pointing straight down. I'm on command fire. You guys will both turn inbound towards one another, keeping the muzzle down. And then once you are facing the target, 
I will give you a color, letter, color, number combination. And you're looking for that. So example, if it's blue eight, you're gonna start scanning with your IR from the floor up, scan IR, scan IR. Oh, I see an eight, scan IR, I see an eight, but I might not be able to make out the color of what the eight is. If you can't make the color out under your IR and your night vision, start over and then, or you know you don't have to necessarily start over unless there was an eight on the other one that you couldn't make out. So white light, oh, nope, white light, maybe, white light, maybe. And two rounds to whatever target has what I call out. All right, boys, so once again, as soon as I say threat, you guys will start to turn around, keep the muzzles down until you're facing the target. And as you're doing that, I will give you what combination or what thing you're looking forward to engage. Remember, it's two rounds per that area, and uh, we scan from the floor up. Any questions? Nope. nope. All right, threat. Blue eight, blue eight, blue eight. Mm, I got an eight left, but I can't tell what it is. I got eight left, eight middle, eight right. Green eight. Blue eight. Blue eight. All right, good job guys, index. So on dual tubes, if you run, if you run the dual tubes like to split your eye and you tilt your head down to look, have a clean picture, and then when you tilt your head up, yeah. you're looking underneath. Um, we run just Viz, uh, Viz daytime optic. Okay. Because you can still shoot with the shit nighttime. You don't have to have the nighttime crap turned on. Okay. It, yeah. So if you if you raise it up a little bit, okay. you tilt your head down. So when you see yeah. it, okay. boom, 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 and then Got you it. don't have to call it out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because your mate should be finding the same shit too. All right. All right. So let's try this again. Threat. Red H. Red H. I got H. Can't confirm color. Oh, man. All right, fellas, index. You guys ready? Ready. Threat. F. 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 Any color F? Yep. Oh, yeah. If you can see it, shoot it. Oof. All right, index. All right, so for this drill, we cleared the weapons, we did a self check, a buddy check, and then we followed by an instructor check, made sure the weapons were totally safe. All right, so what we're gonna do now with the PID drill is we're gonna actually put a Nick down there with JHT and uh, Chris from HRT. Uh, both guys went and put on a, a different t-shirt than what they've been wearing, just so we can maybe ID them based on the t-shirt or not. Also, they have three different items. Uh, they didn't tell us what they were, and they're gonna put their items in their hand to see if we can identify them. Right now, they're starting at about 50 yards, and as they walk closer to us, uh, you can use your vis laser, your uh, white light, whatever you need to do to try to see what's in their hand so we can identify them at whatever distance, all right? You guys have any questions on that? Got it. All right, we'll go ahead and get this started. All right, guys, we are starting. Okay. So both shirts look white. Same color, both shirts, same color. One guy on the right is coming at us. I can't tell what that is. Yeah. Going to white. I still can't tell still what can't it is. can't tell what that is. Positively. Looks like, if I had to guess. A, a holster? Holster. Guess there's a holster and a water bottle. All right, freeze for one second. So we're gonna switch it up a little bit this time. This The PID drill is gonna be the same. Nick and Chris is still down range and only IR only, no other white light or anything out. If, uh, if you can shoot Nick or Chris, just indicate a power bang and then we will get them to stop and then figure out what they have. 
So even if they're this close, uh, like where I'm standing, if this is where you can shoot at, verbalize it, and then we'll stop them right there. You mean when we can positively ID what they have in their hands? Positively ID what they have, not what you think it is, because we can't do that, right? We're civilians or law enforcement. We have to positively identify uh, what we're actually shooting at. All right, all right, all right, guys, start. Okay, it looks Shoot. like a light. Well, I, I guess you're right. Yeah, no, that's a, mistake. that's a mistake I made. And that, that's a good training example because I just assumed seeing a flashlight on the end of a, of a pistol, but that's not necessarily, right, that could so be a flashlight. I can't possibly. Walsh, Walsh said shoot. Yeah. But I can't, Jason, I'll be honest, I can't possibly ID that. All right, what do you got, Nick? Huh? What do you have in your hand? Pistol. Oh, nice. All right. Could you have positively ID no. that, though? No. Why'd it, you shoot? Because I, I think it was just mental familiarity with the shape, like knowing, like, hey, that. Yeah, no, and that's up. and that's the important part. Why I said shoot mentally, like I, I responded to it, and I knew I did not actually positively ID that, and, th and that's a good right, exactly. And that's why I was like, wait, I saw the flashlight, I did not positively ID the actual right. firearm. So yeah. yeah, see if we can do it again. All right, reset. We can't assume because what happens if we assume? Make an ass out of you and me. We make a mistake, oh. and if we make a mistake as a civilian or even in law enforcement, what ends up happening? So we'd have to articulate and try to figure out why we did it and be in court and you know maybe even go to prison. Yep. So uh, this stuff's important, although this stuff is really cool. I'm not talking military, right? For yeah. civilian and LE, we have to positively identify guys. Okay. All right, so the, hey, this time, Nick, Chris, same time, but now they're allowed to use their white light again. All right. Go ahead and start. Okay. I don't know what that is. Going white. Pow. Pow. And and in that situation, I see the the barrel in the front of a gun. Yeah, I could see the frame of the barrel. But night vision? No, I couldn't make that out. Yeah, hold hold it up. Point it at us again, Nick. Yeah. Keep so, coming, Chris. So right there, I cannot. Uh, when you can shoot me or not. When I can, and I can positively ID is that what you have? Yep. Now. Now. Pow. Pow. Yep. But that's the distance. What about me? Uh, looks like a switch, a uh, pocket knife. I can't tell. But I, Keep no, I can't not tell. positive. That's a knife. Go white light. Pow. Oh, yeah, pow. But oh. this is an interesting one. You're what? And, and everyone's seeing this under night vision. You're what? 10 yards from us? Right. Oh, look. If you guys weren't paying attention, that is that just inside. Yeah. That's not even 10 yards. One, it's probably I, about 21 foot. Oh, away. it's easily. I got to be honest. I, I didn't see. You had it at the perfect angle that I couldn't tell that the blade was even out. Yeah, there's no it just looked the blade. like right. you had it's the handle in here. It's carbonated, so as you can see. Yeah. You yeah. can some blunt, but yeah. it's still somewhat. Very little. Blade. Yeah. This will kind of show you some of the difference, one of the few differences in the civilian world where high power versus low power I hour, I hour output may come in handy, which is still if you're running kind of stealthy. Uh, activate your light on us. All right, so wow. oh. now keep in mind, right, let's say we're back in the woods. Keep it on. Keep in mind, let's say we're back in the woods, right? So maybe you're not getting that quite of a glare. Yeah. Flash, or, fl or flash it. Flash, Lou. No, no, off the ground. Bounce it. All right, there we go. So that's not directly in your knob. Can you make him out behind? No. Oh. All right. Now hit him with your illuminator. Push to the proton oh, barrel. Oh wow! So now you uh, have yeah. a high power IR device. You can push to that photon barrel. Can you see him perfectly now? Yes. Now you can see uh, the challenge would be what I don't think I'd be able to do while he had on. It, 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 if you could do that again, I don't think I'd be able to tell if that light was coming from a pistol or a flashlight. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But could you now? You start giving him? commands. Yes. Could you now see if it's him and? Show me your hands. Your old daughter. Yeah. And he's holding his three-year-old daughter's hand like this. Yeah. Could you, you know, see him uh, here? Um, same thing, Blue. Now check your white light's capability. Can you push through with your current white light? Mm. Yeah. You could see him, yeah. but not what he's not holding. Are you overpowering his light? No. 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 So there, but so, the IR does. So that, well, his light is more powerful than your light, yeah. right? Yeah. 
So, because it's his like flooding yours out. He's pushing more than you, right? So that's where candela, lumen, hot spots come into play when it comes into light. Start talking low lights. His light's overpowering yours. You can see him because of where he's at, but his, his light is brighter and overtaking your light. So look, we just finished up the PID drill. That sort of shows importance on working the items on your gun, the white light, the IR, going back and forth, trying to identify what you're looking at. Even some of the tech, uh, like the Unity Sync, is a really good piece of kit you can put on your gun. It really helps streamline and make you more efficient at that. And the boys did a really good job with this. They are still learning, and I'm sure as we kept on doing drills, they slowly improved, improved, improved. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I know, you know Walsh was out here, and we just kind of talked offline afterwards about how you know he had missed a shot when he went up and identified with white light because he was like, you know, I did a passive aim. Uh, but he recognized that, you know, fixed that going forward, which I thought was a huge pickup. Kind of goes back into like the Unity Sync you're right. talking about. Has that Viz Laser Overlight ride. You know, so when you activate the light, you're getting that uh, Viz Laser aiming to set that solution right there. Right. So you don't have to passive aim or acquire your daytime sight. So yeah, I thought that they really progressed and they really did a good job picking up transition between targets. Yep. And then we transitioned actually putting you and Chris downrange with those three objects. And I think there's sort of that aha moment where you may or may not be able to actually pick stuff out. The colors of your guys' shirts, you were wearing black, he was wearing uh, red. Mm -hmm. And then the items in your hand, at what distances could they positively ID stuff? And overall, they did a great job and it's all a learning experience. I think it really shows limitations on a certain equipment that people run and when to transition into other items that's been around and a lot more affordable like white light for a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, having multiple tools on your tool belt makes you more effective. You know, just like in the, you know, we did different things, gun in hand, radio in hand, knife in hand, water bottle in hand, nothing in hand. It basically started out about that 75 yard mark with night vision, then being able to use an IR aiming laser slash illuminator solution to help kind of light that area up to see what we were carrying as we were moving for them. And basically all their rules of engagement, so to speak, were was, you know, hey, just let me know when you can shoot me. Let me know when you can identify what I have. And, you know, there were some errors made and some learning lessons there, you know, incorporating white light, different things like that. One of the things they could do from the law enforcement perspective, right, is obviously checking compliance, giving commands. Hey, free stop, don't move. Put your hands up, manipulate them, different things like that from the LE side. Yep. But Position I thought they did good. Of, uh, power for yeah. us. And... As they got on, I thought they kind of get to do a good job seeing the limitations and utilizing how to incorporate the other tools in there with not just an IR laser like, you know, Call of Duty where, hey, we're just IR laser and everybody, we get to shoot them all and it's just, it's just not right. real life, right? Yeah, you so... Know? Uh, let's go ahead and get the TLD guys in here and see what they have to say. So I think the most interesting thing about the PID drill is you actually start to learn what the technology really can and can't do. When you have to ID a target that maybe, we, you know, we joke about this, they have on a red shirt, they have on blue pants, you need to save a lady with red hair. Just rolling through with an IR laser, you're not going to be able to do that. And we had to transition to white light to see a lot of the targets and work together for that. So I thought that was pretty cool from the PID standpoint. Yeah, we had an instructor who did this. Only I've only ever done this in daytime settings. So one of the things that I really, that I would say, really stood out to me is when you went to your IR illumination, it actually kind of drowned out some of those letters. I couldn't then positively ID what those letters were uh, when we were kind of given the command to stay under IR only. So. Again, understanding the limitations of your weapon system and the tools that you have really is beneficial before you get into a situation like this. You know, I think it's interesting because it comes back to when we're doing our task lights and everything else, it's about having the team set up together where if I have an illuminator that blows out his nods, the same with having a task light that does the same thing, that doesn't help my teammate at all. Yeah. What do you think about, I thought the distances that we could actually identify targets, how crazy do you think that was? Yeah, well, we talked about that kind of in, in car rides and things like that before is, you know, what's a realistic distance that you could positively ID a person? And then the Jawless Hog guys kind of threw in the wrench and the curveball of, okay, maybe a person is easy, but what about when they have something in their hands? Yeah, and, and I made the mistake of just, you know, I'd rather learn it here. I'll tell you that, going to these trainings and doing this and practicing it, making the mistake here, wow, that, that's a good, you know, realization of the error you can make. Like, I thought I made out a pistol because I was looking for a pistol. Like, it could have been, could have been a flashlight just as easily, but I made that error here, but then realized I couldn't make out that pistol till 10 yards, yeah. if, if even, and same with the knife. They, they were basically within, like he was within striking distance before we even recognized he had a weapon at all. Like we didn't even knew he had something until Chris said like, hey, what do I have? And like, yeah. oh, I can't tell. 
Yeah, so it's it's very telling, and, and especially with Chris's blade, there was something about it that it there was no real glint to it. So even when he told us that he had a knife, when he was at 10 yards, I couldn't tell that it was open. So yeah. again, understanding the limitations of the tools that you have, hugely beneficial before you get into a situation like this. And and I know we're doing all these things, we're practicing all this stuff. I think this is a huge one, particularly if you wanna, you know, it's fun to just goof around with night vision, hang out with your friends. But if you wanna actually be effective with night vision, you need to understand the limitation of the technology, what you can and what you can't do. The, yeah, this gives you some superpowers to see at night, but it also takes away some things that you could normally make out with regular vision. So, yeah. very cool. All right, we're gonna wrap everything up, go meet up with the Jawless Hog guys, and get some final thoughts about this video. So the TLD guys did good. They obviously completed their mission, successful op. So the next iteration on this is going to be probably really hard for Jason, and it's going to be driving under night vision. We're going to put their depth perception to the test, see how well they do with the next skill. He's not a very good driver anyway, so we're going to throw some nods on him, change his depth perception up a little bit, see how he does. He's probably going to have to wear a helmet, maybe a crash suit, keep himself safe, but uh, it'll be good, so stay with us. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So depth perception was a huge issue for me coming into the house, so... I'll see how I do it with side by side. I mean, he struggled with the doorway, so we'll see how he does with the driving. So I have to say that was just a ton of fun testing everything out. Just a huge, huge thanks from the TLD team to Jawless Hog, HRT, Opscore for our helmet setups, uh, Princeton Tech for all the lights we were testing, Nocturne for letting us use all the night vision, just all the companies that came together to let us test this and just have some fun. And, and like Jawless Hog kind of let us know, next, make sure to stay tuned because we're doing some night vision driving. Hopefully I don't crash anything. That's, that's the goal. But I hope this video on helmet setups and task lights and how to actually use them was helpful in your purchasing decisions. I wanna say thanks to all of our Patreon supporters and our YouTube members. You make it possible we can come out and do these great things and actually test this gear and hang out with Jason and do cool stuff and see if this stuff's actually worth your time. And I wanna say thanks to everyone that likes, comments, and subscribes. Make sure to let us know down in the comments which of the products you thought was your favorite and the one you want to pick up. We want to hear about it. All right, everyone. Walsh and Jason out. Hey, you didn't mess that up. That was pretty good. <laughs>